is going to talk about a project that he did some decades ago. And uh, the reason that the technology department invited him is because I think it's a fantastic example of using local concepts and Western technology and bringing them together. discussion that so far is not really, really out in the open. Uh, it sort of triggered a little bit by, by my finding a poster which made fun of all the, the whole idea of an overseas studio and sort of said everybody was going to go and drink tequila or go to, or go to Mexico and drink tequila or just go to Tahiti and drink, I don't know, what's the local drink. Um, which, which, which is okay. I mean, that's a, that, that's a, that's a way to be critical. Um, but it does show, and I've heard from a lot of faculty and students that they think this whole thing is a joke, and they and they they don't respect it. They don't see why we're doing it. They can't say it's a waste of money because all the funds got cut. So, but it does bring up two sorts of issues. Number one, which I, I I'd like to talk about for one second, and Bernard, in fact, in what he's talking about, and the fact that he'll describe what this project is in Ruatera. Riotea, sorry. I haven't been there, as you can see. I don't know what their reputation has been in the past. I don't know if when people go to Japan, uh, they just visit Isha houses. I, don't, I haven't been there. But um, I know the Barcelona studio was here. I know the So there's the issue of the studio. dying to come to SciArc and study. Well, last year, the number of students that came to the United States to study increased 1.3%. The number of American students who went abroad to study increased 10%. So the flow's the other way. And this is certainly the trend. Why? Because now we're beginning, I mean, this is a very parochial country. And we're now beginning to realize that, oh gosh, now that we meet all these people from overseas who come here, we're suddenly realizing that there's a big world out there. And I, I agree, and I think we should participate in that. And I think the more we can combine groups of students to go abroad, the better. The so, second issue is the issue of Tahiti itself. And the reason this studio appeals to me is because it's a studio concerned with the transformation of a colonial country into a post-colonial country. Uh, the French have had their way with it and been, been, been very generous for some time now, but in fact, they're going to help And so we're going to have Tahitian maids at $200 a month pretty soon coming into Los Angeles, and everyone's going to say, what, what are all these people coming here for? Well, it's because development wasn't done properly, as it generally hasn't been in any post-colonial situation, and thousands of people are left without livelihood, without any political direction. A few people manipulate them, etc., etc., and the project we tried to put through as a, as a studio was designed to intervene in this process. That is to say, to go in and try to engage in the process of planning for a small island with a small population, with a small infrastructure, without a future, without any knowledge of how it's going to survive once the French go and stop subsidizing them. This seems to me a very serious business. We have the same problem here in LA. We have South Central, where uh, there's six blocks of South Central that produce several murders a, d a year. I mean, this is this is a big pro this is a part of our society that hasn't been organized properly. So it seems to me that any any interchange between ourselves and another culture, the Tahitians, for example, are a matriarchy. I, I think that's absolutely fascinating. And the students are going to have to work with an anthropologist and people to to, 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 to function properly with the customs. I mean, that's a fantastic uh, sort of survival. It seems to me. So this is a serious project to me, addressing very serious issues. Issues that, if they're not grappled with, are going to be even worse in the next century. And I've asked Bernard to sort of give you an example of a typical workday when you get there. And if you think this is going to Waikiki Beach, then God bless you. 
So I'd like to uh, introduce Bernard Judge, and thank you for coming. No, but it's still the tape. For prosperity, uh oh. I have to watch what I say. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. One of these should work. Can we. Uh, oh, there it is. Is this the right one? The other. No. First one. No. Well, while he's getting number one, that's the one. Turn the other one off, please. Please turn the other one off. You can't hear me. Uh, let me just tell you, uh, just in the beginning, how this all started out. In uh, late. In the late 60s, uh, I went to Tahiti as a tourist, and I just fell in love with it. Uh, it was so beautiful that I decided that I would want to do a project there one, one day, and lo and behold, I met somebody that, uh, at a party upon returning that said, okay, if it's that nice, why don't you go and find a site for a hotel, and we'll put a little hotel in. So about 1969 or so, I found myself uh, on the island of Morea, uh, designing a hotel. Uh, and out of that, uh, I got to meet Marlon Brando, who was living there at the time. He had done a, mo a motion picture, uh, Mutiny on the Bounty, in uh, 1962, and uh, had met a lady there and started having children and basically was living there. It's a, it's a, at that time, it was very easy to meet people. And so, uh, a friendship developed and I got to be his house guest for some time. And during the time that I was developing uh, and constructing the hotel, we, he told me about this island that, uh, that he owned. Uh, it's an atoll with 12, it's, uh, 12 islands encircled by a barrier reef. And he had uh, gone out there originally with some friends and had a great time and uh, he'd had it for so many years that it was just becoming a place to go and it was, uh, he had really no idea what to do with it other than that. Uh, various hotel groups uh, had talked to him, uh, the Hilton people had talked to him about putting a hotel there. It turns out that if you build a big hotel with uh, 200 to 400 rooms, you have to pack it with people and that means you have to have airplanes coming in. And this place is so small and so fragile that uh, they didn't see that this would be uh, economically feasible. He talked to Hugh Hefner uh, about bringing a bunch of bunnies there and thinking uh, that would be a great place for, uh, for him. Uh, it turned out that the people who go to bunny clubs are uh, middle-aged businessmen that want to look at bunnies at uh, noon and go home and do something about it at night. They don't want to go to some island in the middle of the Pacific. So that turned out not to be a good idea. He, uh, he even talked to the Black Panthers uh, about setting up a colony there, but they were more interested in fighting the cops in LA than they were uh, living in the South Pacific. So he really had no idea what to do with it. And he asked me if uh, I had any idea. Well, I've been there now for about a year, and uh, he challenged me. He said, look, if you can come up with a concept in, in which uh, I won't lose money, Hopefully it'll pay for itself. It has to pay for itself, and hopefully it'll make money. Uh, I will give, I'll pay for two weeks of your time, pay all expenses, you come back here in two weeks and tell me what to do. Uh, and if I like it, and if it makes sense, economic sense, uh, I will hire you to build uh, the concept. So that was a great challenge, and I uh, took him up on it. So this is really the story of um, what happened when I took him up on this concept. And hopefully I can get this thing going here. The island of Tahiti is at the uh, bottom right. And up near the upper quadrant up there is the island of uh, Tetiaroa, or the atoll of Tetiaroa. It's 45 miles away. And uh, coming up to it, uh, 
for the first time I decided that what I had to do was go visit it, obviously. You go visit the site. Uh, I had arranged with uh, the local banker to come with me because I knew that whatever we did, we had to get a loan. Marlon hadn't worked in a long time and we had to do this with practically no money. The, uh, the Tahitian government does have an investment policy where they do afford low, uh, low terms on loans and they also give you back 10% of what you, uh, of your project cost after you open. So the question was, what could we do with this land? As you can see, there are no mountains here. The highest point of land is probably about three feet. I took along a, uh, a Tahitian fellow. I borrowed a boat. I, by the way, I had no money. This is all bringing in friends. Uh, the, the banker had been a friend because of the first project. This guy was a worker on the first project. Um, here we are disembarking. There's no way to get into the inner lagoon. It's completely surrounded by a barrier reef. And we took along, uh, obviously, French bread. There's a barrier reef, if you, if you can see it, and the lagoon in the background. We were going to be there for 10 days, no radio contact, uh, and the boat was going to come back for us in 10 days. I brought along a surveyor that I had met uh, on my first project. Uh, obviously, we brought all the good things of life, some wine, some bread. There's the barrier reef as you look at it, standing up on it. You, during good times, uh, there are no crashing waves on it. And you can actually stand there, and you're looking down into the ocean. Uh, there could be a 12-foot uh, wave on it, uh, as you can see there. And you can see our little boat. I had a friend that had an airplane. And he took us, you can see the boat up there underneath the wing. That's how we had to get into the island. Oftentimes, uh, the waves get you, and uh, you, uh, everything goes overboard. And you lose everything. But when you get onto the land, this is what it looks like. There had been a coconut plantation uh, many, many, many years ago. The island itself was owned by the Tahitian kings, the royalty. And it was a coconut plantation, but it had not had any human development or life on it for a long time. And there we are, having arrived. We found uh, the remnants of some of the old uh, workers' housing. And we decided that the island that we, the, that we first landed on had too many mosquitoes, so we started going across the lagoon, and we got an old boat and an old bed and an old surfboard, and we kind of put it all together, and we went across to the other island that you see in the background. There we are by sunset coming in. Uh, we brought, that's all the stuff we brought for 10 days. first night on the island. I'm going to go through this rather rapidly here, but just to give you a feel. Uh, dawn, you get used to, there's no electricity obviously, there's no plumbing, so you get used to the, uh, the sun coming up and that's when you get up and the sun goes down, that's when you go to bed. Uh, so this is our first view of Tetiaroa actually having our feet on the ground. We found some some huts that had been abandoned, and we set up camp. And uh, we, this is the, uh, the banker and his wife on the right, and uh, one of Marlon's girlfriends uh, in the middle there. She went fishing uh, very early in the morning, and we had uh, raw fish and beer for breakfast. There we are. The little lemon, they, they, use, uh, they use limes to cook the fish and I set up a drafting board. Now one of the things that we had to do was to figure out how big the island was. We still had no idea how we were going to get people there. So what I had to do is find out what the island looked like, what it was made of, so that we could find out some possibilities for its use. Uh, this is a sort of vegetation. Uh, it was a coconut plantation, as I said. But we, there were some other trees that had been imported in. The coconuts will go across the ocean, they'll go three, four thousand miles, uh, land on an island and uh, start to grow. But uh, other trees uh, would have to get there by birds, mainly birds. 
uh, there was a certain amount, there were pandanus plants. Now this showed me that there was a material that we could use for roofing. The pandanus leaf can be w woven into a, uh, a pretty good roofing material. Now these trees were obviously brought in by people. So we knew that there had been some people there a long, long time ago. That was a very old tree. And this one as well. Uh, we found that these particular trees happened in certain places and not in other places. So we knew that there had been development at some time for some reason underneath these trees. And, and we did find these, uh, uh, these objects coming up out of the ground. Uh, it turns out that this is sort of a calcified uh, sand that is uh, on the, you find it on the beach. What happens is that the, the, the sand has a lot of calcium in it because it's made up of bones uh, and uh, is ground up over the, over the millennium and uh, it's washed ashore. Fresh water with, by rain uh, turns it into a kind of cement with the heat of the sun. So these are slabs that could be used in construction and apparently were used for some reason in pre-contact days. Uh, I had to find out uh, what sort of soils we had. We didn't have very much. As you can see there, the first six inches down is kind of brownish and it uh, has to do with decomposition of organic matter. But the rest is pretty much all um, all sand. Uh, and what I did was I dug a number of holes uh, around the island to get the, the consistency of, of the substrate. But also, I had to find out whether there was any fresh water, because without fresh water, you can't do anything. So one of the determinants of how many people could be even living on an island like this would be how much fresh water there was. And we had to find that out. I had not really come across this, this type of uh, problem before, but I read uh, about the fact that underneath, because of the rains, underneath all, all islands, there is a uh, certain amount of fresh water. And the, the water actually floats above the seawater that also permeates right through the island. So here we are, we're bagging some of the uh, sand and we're bagging the, uh, the initial layers that have a little more organic matter. I brought all, all this stuff back uh, for testing in, in the United States. We, if we were going to have foundations for large buildings or small buildings even, we wanted to know how to make the foundations with the least amount of cement because it, it turned out, it, it seemed to me, that what we didn't want to do was bring in a lot of material because it would simply be ex expensive. And one of the things that Marlon said was that he wasn't going to waste any money on this project. And, and although architects are historically not given any sort of economics in their education, uh, you find yourself in real life having to do this. When I first uh, encountered the, the project on Morea, uh, one of the things I had to do was make sure that everything we did uh, made money for the client. So all of a sudden, I had to know about what things cost and uh, not only the construction part, but the soft costs, the interest rates, uh, what do you do about laundry, what do you do about food, importing food, all these things go into cost. It's not just the building cost. And so I had started to learn about these things. Um, for, uh, for Michael Dobry, I suggest that we do start some economic courses here because when you get out in the field you really need it. And by the way, the AIA standard contract calls for a, uh, an estimate of, uh, of costs at the schematic stage and you'll be faced with that as soon as you start a project. One of the other things that I wanted to do was find out how much water uh, comes down in the rain. So I, we made up a little rain, ga uh, rain gauge in Los Angeles and brought it down with us. Uh, that's a funnel. Uh, with a, uh, a plastic tube going down to the jerry cans of fresh water that we brought with us uh, and had been emptied. And just before we left, we, uh, we buried the cans so they wouldn't get too hot and evaporate out. Uh, there's a loop in that, in that tube 
and some oil was put in the loop so that the water, which is <coughs> the water would go, which is heavier than the oil, would go around the loop and fill up the can, and we would be able to figure out after about a year at least how much rainfall uh, came down that one year. Uh, <coughs> We investigated the, the other islands. We found that on some of them, there were just a tremendous amount of birds. Um, it turns out that these birds are very, very important for the economy of uh, all of the islands in the South Pacific. Uh, the birds uh, have rookeries or <coughs> where there aren't people uh, because people obviously d disturb them. So they come to places like this and they nest and uh, the birds themselves feed from the fish in the ocean. They feed on small fish. And what really happens is that as the large fish, the tuna, marlin and so on, are feeding the small fish, the small fish tend to jump out of the sea. And then the birds come in and they swoop down. So it's very important for fishermen to know where the large fish are. So what they do is they scan the sky and where they see a whole bunch of birds, they drive up their, their boats into the middle of those birds and right underneath the jumping little ones are the big ones that are feeding and that's how they catch their fish. So having learned this, um, I decided that certainly what we would not do would be to uh, put any habitation on any of these islands that had the bird colonies. And you can see how there are no, no predators at all. This is a, 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 an egg that will hatch all by itself um, after the mother has gone. And there are no predators, so that uh, there's, there's a bird with a nest right on the ground. So you can see how important this is. So we, we, we decided that there are certain ecological aspects of the island that we simply could not uh, could not ruin without actually having an effect on all of the neighboring Polynesian islands because these birds will go hundreds of miles sometimes. And uh, in the late 60s, of course, uh, there were no uh, environmental impact reports. Uh, Rachel Carson had written a book and uh, uh, McHarg had written his famous book on design with nature, but uh, it was certainly not in the curriculum of, um, of architects or planners or economists or anybody else. Earth Day was in 1970, I think, for the very first time. So what we were doing is simply learning this as we go along, and our sensitivity towards the island was reinforced by the fact that you could really see evidence very, very quickly. When you're going down some, Sunset Boulevard or Santa Monica Boulevard, you're not really aware of how fragile nature is. But when, when you're in an, in an island environment like this, it really hits you over the head. Uh, well, another thing we tried to do is to find out the life in the lagoon. The life in the lagoon really is different than the life outside the lagoon. Uh, the big fish sharks and so on are out in the ocean, but in the lagoon they were protected. So we tried to find out uh, what sort of life, if any, was in the lagoon. It's not very deep. It's only about six feet deep at one point, uh, for most of it, and maybe 30 feet deep uh, at, one, at one point. Uh, this, we found, was a turtle. There he is. Oops. Uh, there he is underwater. The green turtle, obviously not used to uh, people, and wasn't terribly afraid at all. All kinds of fish, coral fish, all kinds of coral, and a lot of uh, these are coral fish uh, that feed off of the coral. Uh, so we found that there was a good deal of life in the lagoon. At that point, we realized that if we were to have a development and have a harbor that uh, allowed boats to come in, uh, the big fish would come in and uh, certainly have an effect on the ecology of the lagoon. So that was one of our first 
uh, decisions not to uh, make a harbor for boats to come in. A harbor outside the reef is terribly expensive, so the only thing we could have done was have a pass, blow a pass through the coral reef. We decided not to do that. But then the question is, how do you get there if you're going to do anything? And that remains uh, by air. So we decided that uh, the thing to do would be put in a small airstrip. These are just kind of some un underwater shots. Those are the coral. Oh, this is brain coral. So there's a tremendous diversity inside the lagoon, and we wanted to keep that. <coughs> we had a lot of fun, by the way, uh, doing all this. Uh, and um, of course, uh, a lot of uh, coquillas as well. These are land um, crabs, hermit crabs. Uh, they have an interesting sort of life. They're born in the ocean and they crawl up onto the land and they end up uh, as large as this and they, they get to be as large as that. That's about three feet across. They can climb up a coconut tree, cut the coconut down, it drops, and then they crush a coconut. They're so strong. You can stand on one of these guys and you will. So here we're starting to think that, well, maybe we could raise a coconut crab because the meat is very, very good. Uh, we started thinking of, well, can we use the lagoon as some sort of an aquaculture project so that maybe what we had in the making was a farm. Uh, so we we noted all of these things. And before leaving, since um, I won't go into the story of what was left out, but what, one of the things we did leave out was a way of measuring the, the surveyor forgot the one instrument that we needed to figure out how exactly how large some of these islands were and how far apart they were from each other. So what we did was we buried these uh, plastic uh, sacks that we had brought with us in the sand just for that purpose, as it turns out. Uh, exactly 100 meters apart. And then we came back by air, and uh, there we are leaving. We came back by air, and we were able to, by knowing exactly how, how, uh, how high you are, and you take a bunch of photographs just like this, where this is uh, 5,000 feet up, uh, with a magnifying glass, you can find out where those little red dots are. And uh, we also used infrared film because I figured that in order to find the water table, uh, there would be more, uh, more uh, an abundance of green uh, where there would be more water. And, and infrared green turns out to be red. And so you can see in the middle of the island, that's where we look for our water. So anyway, we ended up with the very first map of Tetiaroa uh, coming back to the States. Uh, so in 10 days, we were able to do a, a reconnaissance of the island as far as mapping goes. We, we did a reconnaissance of the island as far as the animal and vegetable matter went, as well as the soil. Then we got together. Uh, I had a very small office, still do. I uh, had a fellow that was working with me, Ron Smart, and uh, a young lady at the time, Milica Mihish, who actually taught at this school for a while. Uh, and the three of us sat down and we tried to figure out what the best approach to what we knew uh, to be the case on Tetiaroa. And what we decided was that we would uh, access it by air. That's the dashed black line. Uh, we, uh, we had to find out what kind of planes were available. It turns out that they do have sole aircraft there, that is to say short landing and takeoff. And we needed 600 feet of runway. We decided that uh, because of the, the bird population being the gray areas on the right, we would put the, uh, the airstrip on, on the left. So we had to be able to get there. And then we would try to do some nutriculture, which is uh, planting of uh, plants and vegetables, and aquaculture, which has to do with the uh, raising of uh, sea life. It, we started out by thinking we could use the lagoon, but as I looked into it, uh, it was much more profitable to set up large basins, grow the fish, 
and take the water from the lagoon or the sea and make it go through a cycle. Um, that way if any fish get, you, you do this in separate, in separate areas so if any fish start dying or have a disease they don't transfer it to others. And you don't louse up the lagoon uh, ecology in doing this. The thought was that obviously there's going to be something going on there. Should it be tourism? We decided it could not be tourism. Uh, there was not enough uh, there for tourism, and if you do have tourism, it would louse the place up. So, what visit visitation, particularly short term visitation, would be bad because people <coughs> expect to use the lagoon for, for instance, uh, skiing and that sort of thing. Um, then we, ha we have to bring in boats with, with motors, that means fuel, uh, it would mean loud, uh, loud noise. It would be better, we thought, to make a village that was self-supportive economically with nutriculture and agriculture. Uh, it, we would have a base where scientists could come for longer periods of time. Uh, scientists are not as fussy as far as living conditions. They're willing to take a shower with only cold water or a shower that where you bring down a handle and you let, you let go the handle and the water stops and then you soap yourself and you bring down the handle, that sort of thing. You can't do that with tourists. So we decided that tourism would really not be the case. But we would have a, um, a small village uh, that would be self-sustaining using some visitation. Uh, Marlon was particularly interested in having local people come there not so much popa, people like us. Uh, and so we presented this master plan to him. Uh, he accepted it. And the next uh, thing to do was to talk to the government, see if uh, they would like the idea, we could get the loans and so on. And uh, we went ahead and were given uh, a contract to, to develop the island along these lines. So this is just a... Uh, a little diagram that shows the water, the freshwater lens, which is uh, in this sort of hyperbolic uh, configuration underneath the, the coral. Uh, we were able to find out because the specific gravity of water is 1 to 40 with seawater. Uh, so with every one centimeter above sea level, there was 40 centimeters of water below the sea, sea level. So we were able to figure out how many we thought uh, gallons of water would be uh, available on a yearly basis and replenished by, uh, by rain. Uh, once we found out how much water was available and we figured X numbers of gallons per person per day, we were able to figure out how many people could live on one of these small atolls. Uh, this is one of our first maps that shows where the sun is. The sun, of course, goes in the, uh, in the uh, opposite direction uh, because we're in the southern hemisphere. Uh, the wind direction gives us an idea of where, how to orient the, air, the airstrip. The round areas in white uh, are near darker vegetation. That vegetation was imported vegetation, and that's where we found uh, remnants of uh, archaeological remnants of uh, people that had been living there pre-contact. Uh, the the middle portions that are kind of in the uh, the buff color are where we found the most water. So we had the, the next thing to do was to develop kind of a village. Uh, this was the first pass of the village. We had the airstrip. By the way, was going to be a grass airstrip. Uh, we weren't going to have energy for lights, so we were going to simply have white sand on, on either side of the airstrip so that even at night in an emergency situation somebody could land there. Uh, energy became a real problem. What do you do? You, uh, how do you make electricity? Uh, there's wind power, there's solar power, but these were not very advanced at that time in the early 70s. Uh, we would have to bring in a certain amount of fuel. We wanted to keep it to a minimum because of fuel leaks and the, just the, uh, uh, the toughness of trying to get anything over that reef. 
uh, one, one of the interesting things about this particular slide is that I've been there long enough to know that Western people uh, like to visit islands, but they like to be apart from one another. If you go there with your honey, you don't want to be sitting next to, or, or uh, living right next to somebody else and hear them in the day and night radios and so on. So what we wanted to do was make a bunch of little huts that were made out of local material and far enough away from each other so that uh, it would be comfortable. But I was, but it, it turned out that I had been in Tahiti long enough to know that uh, the Tahitians don't like to live uh, far away. They are a very communal society and they like to be close together. And so I left, uh, and we had to have kind of a workers' camp. Uh, and they didn't want to be with the popas. And so I said, well, where do you want to do it? So they went over there. Now, it's really interesting. It's, it's warmer over there because the trade winds are coming this way. But they don't like the trade winds. They all wear sweaters in the trade wind. And uh, obviously, it's hot in these places. So they made their own, they designed their own village. And so I designed the village over here. Uh, thinking that uh, this is uh, going to be where the scientists or visitors would come and, and live, and then we would have a central place uh, to eat and, and gather. And we went through this whole business of uh, designing uh, the feeling there. And of course, this is how we, I think, oh, um, what do you do about refuge? What do you do about sewers? There are no sewers. Uh, we went to, I won't go through all this because I know we have a time limit, but basically we went to a black water, gray water uh, system where the, the gray water, which is just basically from showers and sinks and uh, is not really very polluted except for soap, uh, can be used for irrigation. And you can see the amount of black water as compared to uh, gray water uh, it's only one cubic foot rather than 22 cubic feet. So that's a very, very small percentage. And that we were going to try to uh, have a septic system that would uh, allow us to uh, use some of the effluent for, I don't know if that, can we get that from, for uh, composting. Uh, can't read that too well, I suppose. But basically the idea was that uh, water on the left could be used for showers and sinks, gray water, sand filter, use it for irrigation. Irrigation would be used for flowers, vegetables, and the plantation. And the kitchen, and I can't read what that is up there, and the plantation, uh, fallen leaves, collection, composting. Kitchen, wet garbage, collection, composting, methane production, which turned out to be not as much as what we thought. Um, I, by this time, we, were, we, were, we did have some pretty good consultants, and I had uh, Boris Limos with my, was my uh, uh, consultant on waste management. And when we suggested methane production, uh, Boris had uh, originally come from Russia, and he said, Bernard, you won't get enough gas out of methane production uh, as compared to the fart of an Abyssinian goat. So we uh, decided not to go along that way. Uh, this is even more complicated, uh, but basically we had to have the economics uh, work out uh, for everything we did. The diesel fuel, uh, agriculture, nutriculture, and we had to prove to the people who were going to lend us the money that we could pay it back. Uh, here's the boss, uh, happy that something's going on on his island. And uh, here he is, uh, always worried about money. He said, hey, look, maybe we can make hats. Maybe we can sell hats. He was always looking for a way of, of uh, doing something uh, to make money. And I would say, yes, we can make hats. But knowing full well that you know, it's not going to pay for uh, the development. Uh, I learned, by the way, that uh, when a client says something like this, you say, yes, yes. Uh, he suggested, for instance, why, why bring bulldozers? Let's bring an elephant. Because elephants in India, they, they, 
they're a very good worker. They said, well, wait, geez, an elephant. How are we going to feed the elephant? He said, well, there's tons of stuff around here, and they poop, big, big poops, and we can use that in our composting. And isn't by the time that an elephant poop grows enough food for the elephant to eat, the poor elephant won't be able to work. So, you know, we were constantly doing things like this. Uh, he also had the idea that instead for, for, for um, uh, skiing, water skiing, uh, we could, in, we could uh, train dolphins to, he said, you heard of dog sleds? I said, sure, I know dog sleds. How about dolphin sleds? And, we just, and then we would just feed the dolphins. And I said, what do you feed the dolphins? You know, so it just, this went on all the time. He was a, a, good originator, a good originator of ideas, so. But it just did keep us laughing. Um, then it's the final day came to start construction. Uh, I talked the French Navy into letting us have one of these. By the way, the whole budget for this is $100,000. So um, the, I got the Navy to, uh, the, I got the captain drunk on a weekend, and I said, look, we have to deposit a whole bunch of stuff there. We're going to build an airstrip, and we're going to build a village, and everybody laughed and couldn't do it. And uh, so there's everything. That's four months worth of equipment on one boat. It's supposed to last four months. It lasted four years. So things go a lot slower than you think. Uh, how do you get a bulldozer across the reef and across a, uh, a lagoon? Well, you build yourself a raft. Here we are getting some wood in. We have some, you dump the wood and have some swimmers that push the wood over the reef. And then you take these empty drums and you push them over the reef. And then during the night, you make a raft and it's buoyed up by these empty drums. And uh, you have a little seagull, one horsepower motor. And there we are the next day uh, <coughs> waiting for the boat to, uh, and of course, everybody goes fishing, you know. You have to have three people to do one man's job because two people are always fishing. <laughs> and the clamming, of course, you know. So. And there's the boat. That we, I, I bought a case of Johnny Red Walker, and I kept on feeding it to this captain. He said, oh, I'm going to get in trouble, I'm going to get in trouble. This will never work. And so here we are. Luckily, I had uh, worked with the French Navy to find out when the best day of the year traditionally is for the least amount of tide. Uh, and we had satellites uh, showing us the weather conditions. And uh, we were able to empty this boat uh, in about 20 minutes. Uh, so it was a real mess, but we got it done. And there was the last piece of equipment leaving the boat. And it's a box. And in this box is a three kilowatt generator because we knew we, knew we would have to have at least some electricity. Uh, so we uh, bought a $3,000 three kilowatt generator and uh, we're going to put it on the raft and there's the guy leaving with a great sigh of relief. And so here we are, it's about two o'clock. <laughs> it's taken much longer because the guy just hemmed and hawed and wouldn't come into the reef. And finally, here we are, it's about two o'clock, three o'clock in the afternoon. I said, oh my God, tide's, com tide's coming up. What do we do? So there we are, the bulldozer uh, clearing a path for the raft to come up close. And, uh, the <laughs> and here's, we're going to get those trucks up on this raft, right? On these boards, this is for first traffic copy of this <laughs> on Tetiaroa. And there's, <laughs> it's not working too well, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but finally we get everything done. And at the end of the day, we got the grader on board and most of the fuel. And what was left was the, the generator. And that night, there's the, uh, that night there was a huge storm and I looked out with my binoculars in the morning and said, oh, uh, where's the generator? No generator to be seen. Uh, so this poor guy in the, uh, in the uh, bulldozer came to land. He went all the way across that 
lagoon, and at one point he was so deep, all we could see was a little hat going across the water. <laughs> and there he is. <laughs> and that was what was left of the raft. One plank and the seagull. And there's our first tracks of, of uh, civilization on, on this island of uh, Tetiaroa. Uh, next slide, Trey. Oh, the other one? Okay. Boy, organization here. Okay. Uh, ten minutes? Jesus, I'll never make it. Okay, well, we set up camp, and there's my first AIA meeting. And we put a radio in. Uh, we started making uh, palm frond uh, roofing material. I have to go through this real fast. Um, since everything got uh, ruined uh, coming in, we had to wash everything, the first parking lot, taking down trees for the airstrip, uh, keeping the logs for posts in construction, uh, taking the palm fronds and the burying them so that we could make compost. There it is. Compost heat starting. Uh, these are the logs. Uh, we found an, air, an airplane that had apparently landed a long time ago and uh, crashed, and we found the pontoon. And we went out to uh, get. Is this not in focus? I don't seem to be doing too well in focus. And we found this uh, $3,000 uh, generator, and uh, I had a one day Lloyd's of London. Uh, insurance policy for that for that generator and it cost me three thousand dollars and later on oh somebody always goes clamming of course uh, and so they paid and they actually bought us a new generator which came by air much much later but anyway my uh, my drafting room is improved slightly and I brought my family my daughter is now 20, about 35 years old and we set up camp, and we stayed there for four years. Well, um, this will just give you an idea of our living conditions. Normally I have a lot to say about all this, but um, there's a caveo that we're starting to collect. And this is what we ate every day. It wasn't bad. All local stuff. A lot of coconuts, copra. We thought of selling copra. And every once in a while, we'd have a big party. All these guys are walking around in shorts uh, during construction. All of a sudden, on, on May Day, all these Hawaiian shirts came out. Couldn't believe it. But I got the banker in. Always bring your banker and involve him with your project. Uh, here we are clearing for the airstrip. We're collecting the top layer. Remember the top layer of, uh, of earth? We don't want to waste it, we stockpile it. And then we fill up the holes from the roots of the, uh, of the trees that we took down with sand. And uh, now we fill it with uh, the good earth so we can grow some, uh, some grass. And here's our first plane coming in. Uh, later on, uh, Air Tahiti was able to land. And there's our generator coming in that's uh, replacing the one that we've lost. So insurance uh, is something you have to think about. And uh, uh, this is a uh, house for that generator. You notice that uh, in the middle, it's a water-cooled generator. I use plastic sheathing to allow light to come in so we didn't have to use electricity. It's also a funnel because it comes in two. It's in the middle. You can't see it from outside, so it's, it looks like a regular hut from the outside but it's funneling rainwater into a basin which cools the generator. So that's architecture. Uh, water, uh, I go through this whole thing, I won't bury with it now, but basically what we're doing is collecting the water in very, very shallow wells with very tiny, tiny pumps into a uh, $200 Sears Roebuck swimming pool on the ground, and from there we pump it up into trees, and from there on it's all gravity. These are all systems that we designed. Um, there's the pump. It's a tiny, tiny little pump 
works on very little electricity, uh, very little electricity, and what, what, you, what it does is it pumps the water into this chamber. The chamber has a hat on it, a top on it, and it compresses the air as the water fills up into that chamber. The whole thing is only about two feet high, and the, the compressed air goes from about one foot to about six inches. And then the, uh, the pump kicks off, and the pressure of the air itself inside this container pushes it into the next, uh, this, this $200 swimming pool that we got. Uh, we were developing ways of doing things economically all the time uh, and with the least amount of energy consumption. Uh, this is uh, our higher tower. And from here on in, uh, now we're starting to construct. Uh, how do you treat wood so that it's not eaten by all the little organisms? You, you dry it out, you stick it in the lagoon, it brings in the salts, and the salts uh, are not uh, eaten by the uh, little buggies. Uh, same thing with the leaves uh, for the roofing materials. These are the coconut posts that we're now going to be using for construction. Uh, prefabrication, of course. Uh, we make trusses, uh, stack them up, and uh, we start uh, constructing the, the buildings. All out of native materials, very, very little importation, uh, using construction methods that actually are not being used in Tahiti anymore. Because what has happened is that on all these islands, uh, they've become very Europeanized. Uh, all the wood for construction comes from California and, and New Zealand. And they have regular two by fours. They pay a, an awful lot of money for it. And actually, they don't have to. They can just go into the forest themselves. But they've lost these techniques. And we were kind of, uh, we got into it backwards. We, we felt that it would be silly and stupid to spend all this money to bring down material when it was all around us. So, I tried to get people from far, far away islands that could help us in, in uh, choosing the right trees and so on. Because a lot of this knowledge had been lost and I made up a lot of it myself. <coughs> There's our windows. I'm supposed to be looking at the window. Uh, we use the sand itself uh, as forms, uh, carving into the sand, tilt up construction. Uh, coconut, we, we brought in some saws, uh, Alaskan uh, saws, and uh, we made our own lumber out of coconut wood, something that had not been uh, done before as a floor using coconut wood. At the same time, I had Yoshi Sinoto of the University of Hawaii uh, come down and do some digs in those areas where we found that there had been habitation in pre-contact days. And this is where the, my origination of bringing students from all over to work on, in places like this. We had people from the University of Hawaii come down, some students, as well as a professor. We had local kids come and join them. And we had uh, digs uh, a couple years in a row. The students made their own shelters. It would give them a feeling of how people had to live in those days, before electricity and before all the rest. We found graves, uh, and uh, we found these are the same uh, stones after the jungle has been cleared and there's the earth strip. Uh, these, these were ads that we had found and, and uh, hooks. Uh, and because of the size of the ads, their shape, and the type of stone, we were able to find out that six different island groups had been there at different times. We also had people uh, come, uh, scientists started coming now and uh, using Tetiaroa as a research station, which is exactly what we wanted to do. Uh, we started farming turtles. How are we doing on time, Mi uh, Michael? Uh, you should be starting your... Uh, oh, in other words, I have 10 more minutes. <laughs> okay, well, I'll go through this real quick, but we started a turtle farm. Uh, Uh, we started the Caveo farm. And we kept on constructing the village. 
using native materials is interesting what's, what you can really do. Uh, iron wood, that's the bar. Coconut planks. We built a sewer, which uh, was used for many years before a huge hurricane came. This, uh, this will not allow me to bore you with how, what do you do with sewage. Basically, you don't let it go into the sand. You put it into a basin with a, with a, uh, uh, a floor on it so that uh, through evaporation and, and uh, you put plants in there so they take up the water too. Uh, this is a public toilet facility. Aspiration as well as evaporation. Using local materials as much as possible. And this is what it looked like uh, basically when I left about uh, 25 years ago. But it did, did take about four years slightly over $100,000. This is the interior of one of the uh, living quarters. This is the main crescent-shaped uh, building, which is used as a uh, dining room. Inside of one of the huts, there's the dining room. And that's uh, something to remember, I saw it. We even got to do our own graphics. OK, I think I'll stop now. What happened was there was a big hurricane about 15 years ago. And the place was pretty much destroyed. And uh, I was able to get a contract to rebuild the place under different conditions, because now we knew a lot more. But uh, I won't go through that because of time constraints. So um, would you like me to mention a little bit about the idea of going back with some students? Uh, yeah. Uh, because of the fact that I have been involved with, with Tahiti for so long, um, I got to know a lot of people. And uh, two years ago, an American company contacted me about a project that they had in mind, which was to create electricity using the motion of the waves, as the waves go up and down. A big boy goes up and down, it turns a, a generator, basically. And the reason that they ended up in Tahiti uh, was because they, they were in Hawaii, where energy costs are, are high, uh, and they uh, felt that uh, it was also a body of, uh, an island surrounded by a body of water, uh, but they had to find places where importing oil to create energy was so high that this would be a natural place for them to start. In, on an island called Rayatea, the energy costs are about 60 cents a kilowatt hour. And they can produce, my, this company that hired me, can produce electricity and sell it for 15 cents. They make it for about five. So there's tremendous economic advantage for both parties. Uh, the people that make the energy make money, and the people that use the energy don't have to pay as much. So it, over a two-year period, I got to know the mayor pretty well. And it became quite apparent that after a certain amount of time, if energy costs, if this project really did work, and if energy costs did go down so much, this island all of a sudden would have electricity in, in abundance. And therefore, they could have light industry. Uh, they could have a port. The people in, on these small islands, from 300 people to 3,000 people, uh, don't have anything to do, uh, which is fine for the older folk. But the young people want to be part of the 20th century. So they all leave. And they don't have subsistence economy anymore. They don't just fish, and they just don't gather fruit, as the old people can live. And they're very happy to live that way. But the young people all go to Papiete. In Papiete, there's not enough work for everybody. About two-thirds of the population now in French Polynesia are under 21 years old. They don't know what to do. There's no economy because 
France has been a very benevolent uh, father or mother. They pay for the school system, they pay for the hospitals, they pay for the infrastructure. Uh, and the reason they have done this is because that was their atomic testing site about a thousand miles away. So th they had a reason to, to be there. They also sell the fishing rights to the Japanese and the Koreans. There's a huge body of water that is in, in encompassed by in French Polynesia, bigger than the United States, thousands and thousands of square miles. So they have an economic incentive and they had a military incentive. But that military incentive is no longer viable because we, we, we don't have Russia anymore to be afraid of. Uh, the economic uh, incentive is, is becoming less politically viable because the Tahitians are saying, now wait a minute, why are you selling our birthright? Our birthright is our ocean and our fish. So there's, a, there's an independence movement. So it becomes, it's going to become a liability one of these days. And the French people are saying, we're, we're tired of spending our taxes. So one of these days, Tahiti is going to be an independent country. There won't be any raison d'etre for it. There won't be any industry. They've been pampered. So what do you do in a situation like this? I became very interested in, in, in the idea of how does a culture transform itself? And one of the things that became apparent is that if you want to be part of the 20th century, you simply have to have energy. And if we provide energy to this particular island, or any other island for that matter, uh, in a way that is uh, <coughs> renewable, that is to say non-destructive, uh, then you can take part in the 20th century. The mayor is a very wise man and he said, okay Bernard, why don't you do a master plan for the development of my island? And so I told him how much I would charge and then he said, well, maybe we don't have to do that. <laughs> it's a lot of money. Because I, I did, I, I assembled a, a team of professionals from here, and we were going to charge them about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to do a, a decent master plan. So when that fell through, about a year later, about maybe in June, I think it was, uh, when I went down there, uh, the French government was was going to provide a planner for the island. So they they were going to pump a little money in, and so the mayor came up to me and said, "Look, would you like to?" work with this guy and I didn't really want to work with with the French government because all the ideas come from above and you simply are disseminating the ideas that are not your own. So I said I had been talking with Michael and Michael's idea of providing students with the opportunity of visiting other places and working in other places and so the two thoughts came together at the same time and I said to the mayor I said look what if I come down here with some students and we will do a master planning class and actually break up into into teams and provide options uh, which may be different than the options that are being given to you uh, by the French government and he liked the idea so he wrote a letter to uh, Michael Rotundi uh, asking if uh, uh, it would be possible to bring some students down and, and do this and uh, this was well received and so basically, um, I've tried to organize a, a way for students to come down with me uh, this, uh, uh, this next semester. Uh, it would be a 16-week uh, class, if, if you will, or you could do it on independent study. I, I don't know the, the bureaucratic part of it so well. Uh, but uh, we would spend two months there and the rest of the time here, three weeks here, two months there, and then uh, another five weeks here. And what we would do is do our research and our documentation down there. We would do the data collection, tremendous amount of data collection, population, uh, what do you do about sewers and what do you do about infrastructure, what do you do about uh, uh, schools, how do you plan for the, uh, the development of, uh, of a port, uh, what do you do about uh, if people are going to be, if there is going to be a port and people are not going to leave, you have to have more schools, uh, what is the, how many people will stay, what is their family size and so on. So it's, it's the sort of planning that goes on anywhere and should go on anywhere. But the one thing that we were going to do differently is we were going to try to get the local people involved in the decision-making process. And how do you do that? Because we have a language difficulty. So 
Michael, having been involved with the uh, entertainment business for some number of years, suggested that perhaps we could use uh, TV. So what we're going to do is we're going to record what we're doing. And we are going to end up with uh, something that can be shown over local TV down there so that people can see the opportunities and make educated choices. And once this is done on one island, obviously, because TV is, uh, is a universal uh, medium, it's going to be shown on other islands. So what we're really doing is starting a process where we can learn and they can learn. And I think it's a wonderful opportunity. And I would like to invite anybody who wants to come down with us uh, to do that. We have a certain amount of people that are already signed up. Uh, to do that, you will get credit uh, in your courses. And uh, Michael wanted me to make sure that I said that this would not be simply uh, fun and games and vacation. But you can see that working in this type of environment is fun, but it is also extremely educational. And just to give you an idea of what, what we'll, we will be doing on the first couple of days, we're going to get there about 6 o'clock in the morning. Uh, we're going to visit the marketplace. Uh, just so I get an idea of what happens. So then we're going to go to the city dump. Then we're going to take a boat over to Morea. We're going to take showers. And then we're going to listen to a lecture on water. And then we're going to go around the island and see how they live on an island like this. And by 6 o'clock at night, you go to bed, you get up at 6 in the morning, and you start all over again. I have contacts down there with hydrologists with archaeologists, with anthropologists, with people in the government. We're going to be working uh, six days a week, six in the morning, six at night, two hours for dinner, and then we have courses at night. So this is not a vacation. This is going to be fun, but it's going to be real involvement with real people on a real project. And um, I hope that lays that vacation notion to rest. <laughs> Sundays are off, but I want everybody to go to church. <laughs> Any questions? Or, uh, or volunteers? <laughs> if you'd like to talk to Bernard, um, he's going to be down the mansion for lunch. Uh, so if you want to find out more about it,